Let's go live with Jack Kelly. Welcome to the one of a kind LinkedIn live show that will help you with your job search and advancing your career. We will bring in educated career experts who will share their insights and give you inside tips on how to be successful in your job search. Now let's get into today's show with your host, Jack Kelly. I want to welcome you, Mark, my good friend, Mark Anthony Dyson. Yes. The voice of the people, the voice <laughs> of the job seeker. Maybe. The voice of everybody, <laughs> the career expert, prolific okay. writer, all around great guy. Glad to join me on the uh, LinkedIn Live with Jack Kelly. Yes, well, thanks for having me. Uh, honored to be here, even though I talk to you like multiple times <laughs> a week. <laughs> but so, it's really cool. Thanks. But, hey, I got to thank you because, you know, you, you were so kind to bring me aboard on your show every Wednesday at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And you know, really enjoyed doing it. And that led in part to me being able to do a LinkedIn Live as well. So I really got to show you know, my appreciation and gratitude for doing that because I think without it, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Well, let's get part of the facts right. You okay. invited me on <laughs> your, well, our venture, you invited okay. me it. And it is, it's become quite a ride so far because yeah. we, it, it, people who are kind of aspiring to do live stream, do it even if there's one person watching because people come back and watch the show yeah. and it's on LinkedIn forever as yeah. far as you know. So, you know, even if you do it when nobody's watching, which I've done, uh, then uh, go ahead and do it. But there's two people that can do it and somebody can go on the ride with you. It makes it a whole lot easier to do. You know, it's so interesting you say that because I was, I was listening to a podcast and mm -hmm. then it ended and another one popped up. You ever have that? And then yep. you find yourself listening to something you would have no ordinarily not do. And it was about this woman and she was talking about for 13 years, mm -hmm. she was trying to make it in the music business. Yeah. And nothing, nothing, go to different cities. She would say she would go to tours. She would hand out leaflets to people and hoping to get, you know, two, three, five people in there. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden she cut a single, blew up. So after 13 years of talking to one, you know, going in front of two people, 10 people, 15 people, mm -hmm. she, she was an opening act for Taylor Swift and, yeah. and bam, just, I don't even know her name because I don't know that, that kind of pop world. Yeah, but, uh, I, 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 I'm familiar with the story. I forgot exactly who the artist is. I'm yeah. sure somebody would tell us in the comments. But I think she's uh, with the, this is my fight song. This is that song that uh, whoever is behind that. Okay. Yeah, I'm still okay. going a blur. As probably I listen to everything more, uh, more so from 2010 back than I yeah. do. 2010. So nothing current. So, well, I do know some current songs, um, but I try to find the artists that very few people hear from because I'm feeling like many times I they resonate with me more than the uh, pop rush that we get yeah. today. You know, I'm, I'm a complete music geek. So when it comes to history, we know that in history, that's ha that happens all the time. And that's part of paying your dues, so to speak. So, you know, that's what carried me through sometimes thinking, yeah. well, you know, uh, you know, Don Henley and, and uh, Glenn Fry started out with uh, empty bars at times. So, you know, look where, uh, look it's, where they went. So, you know. I think that's a, that's a good story just for people who are looking for a job as well. It's, you mm -hmm. know, cause it looks bleak. It looks like nothing's gonna happen. And then all of a sudden you catch one break and it makes all the difference, right? Yeah, you Changes just your life. Know. Yeah, it, you just never yeah. know. But you got to be willing to, you know. Um, yeah, I remember when I first started my blog, I wrote with maybe one person reading, and that wasn't my wife <laughs> or my mother. So, <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, it gets there, yeah. um, and eventually, somebody will find you if you have, you know, if you have, uh, you know, endured the. Uh, silence. And uh, I think job seekers have to learn to do that. Um, when it doesn't seem like somebody is paying attention, people, especially these days on social, and if you're regular on social, somebody will be paying attention and looking at you uh, be resilient. And that's something that 
you know, employers love these days is they love uh, somebody who's resilient, who can wade through the criticism and or wade through the silence and be able to push through. That's true. And Mark, I think a lot of people listen and watch this because in our Wednesday calls, I think we go over a lot of career oriented mm -hmm. uh, material, a lot of job advice, actual advice, but we have a kind of a loose jocular, you know, feel. This is, yeah. I think, maybe a little different because it's a pretty serious matter. I know right. reading a lot of your writing in Medium and other places and listening to your interview on NPR, you talk a lot about race in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I thought that this could be a really good format and a good platform yeah. so that you could share like some of your thoughts that you, you've written about to the audience mm -hmm. in terms of what do you see in the marketplace, how do you think there could be change? What kind of challenges do people have? And yeah. I think a lot of people want to hear kind of your experience, your thoughts, mm -hmm. your suggestions for how things can be. Yeah. Well, thank you, first of all. And I'm not surprised you asked me on uh, to talk about this because I know you uh, and we get a chance to connect and we've connected on all these levels. And I think that's where, you know, my inner circle, so to speak, we've at least had this discussion yeah. once or several times. So I'm not surprised you invite me. Sometimes I get a little surprised by how uh, others will had started to talk about it and then they waned off. And that really didn't surprise me that much either. But people come from different places. Uh, I'm one to be a little patient uh, with folks instead of uh, they don't really care about me or they don't care about my race. That's not the mind frame at all. It's that, you know, if you allow me through your feed, then you want to hear something from me. Right. And, you know, and I have to, I realize that that's going to take a little bit of time the more I talk about it. Yeah. And after all, for many years, for most of the years, I didn't mention it all that much. But of course, last spring, Kind of uh the medium column and then of course the posts that i wrote uh on linkedin my updates uh that got a lot of attention and so you know i built the equity first and giving job advice for everybody and i still do that hasn't changed but i definitely like the fact too that i can also uh, assert other thoughts in it and the other thing too i want to kind of cover is that my specific niche is pared down to the job search more than a workplace though i write about the workplace yeah it's a big thing mm -hmm. but a lot of times it's it, it's in the job search because a lot of it that's where a lot of it begins for a lot of uh black job seekers one, well, let's jump into that so what yeah, is i was, gonna, I, I was yeah. gonna say that was one of the first things is at first yeah. is that as soon as you see a name that's different mark is easy to get to get along but if you saw jamal or if you saw khadija you you know automatically the name puts you in another pile for many for many times in many years uh i don't have to go through the studies people can google it you can start with the harvard study and uh i think it's a london university and many others who studied this and these studies are worldwide that names do matter when it comes to uh hiring and whether mm -hmm. you get even considered so that starts off from the jump so right from the beginning right from the beginning yeah, the moment right you get that resume beginning. And, and the second thing I want to be sure to say that I'm not saying everybody does that. I will say that most employers have have kind of admitted it either by omission or commission. And in fact, when you look at their company, you look at their their board, uh, their board members, you look at their management and you see nobody that looks like me or the skin tone like I have, or somebody has a darker skin than white then we know that that there's some things that exist that you that most companies don't admit to but there are some that you know are concerned and you know grateful for that but we got such a long way to go uh and uh, i think i have the ability to start that discussion so i'm not one of those you know diversity inclusion equity experts i don't claim that at all i just write about the job search and i'm calling it as i see it sometimes that's better in the sense that 
you're living it. You know what you've seen it. You talk to so many people all day long mm -hmm. so that, okay, you're just get, you're presenting the reality as you see right. it on a, on, a, on a daily basis. Right. And because of your platform and you're always online speaking to people, interacting. So you do mm -hmm. get, you know, a sense of what's happening. Oh, I, I think I think I get the I've had the pulse for a number of years. Yeah. Um, I I think also I have the other side is that I've done hiring, I've done hiring for large organizations, and so I know what it's like to look through a stack of resumes and to have to make a decision. It's funny that even though a lot of my I wasn't in the upper tier of management. Well, you know how it is, upper tier of management, you don't see thousands of resumes like you do in uh, the first and second line supervisory positions and team lead positions where you're looking through thousands because of the number of turnovers that you have. So that was my experience. And fortunately, I was able to soak it in, make some sense of it. And of course, that comes through in my content. So what do you do? So let's take the example, you start out, you send a resume and you feel that a hiring manager in HR is going to see a name and then formulate a preconceived notion about who that person is. Mm -hmm. So just from the get go, what would you suggest that companies should do? Just starting with that point, you know, like the first step. Well, let's break down from, from uh, maybe start from an elementary position. And, and okay. Uh, so, um, one of the things I talk about very often is that a lot of times in the past, better now because of the, of the web, but uh, Black people don't get exposure to a lot of those great paying positions that have been out there because many times the companies don't market to them. In other words, I gave an example in one of my articles and I've seen it happen up front so I know it happens is that let's say you work in a downtown office there's some great positions that you have so but the company doesn't want to put that money out there at the time when they were doing newspapers and things um, you don't want to put the ad and spend the money on the expense uh, for the Chicago Tribune and career builder or or put it online when it was early on on monster Instead, you decide to put it in some local papers that offer free distribution. Those free distributions are only go to locally. Well, if I live in the downtown north side area of Chicago, uh, there, isn't, there aren't many black people who live in those areas, but the people who get the exposure are the ones that live in those neighborhoods. The only way that black people will get in those uh, get those particular types of positions is if they get a referral, then they get a shot. If there's not a referral, then of course, most people are looking at what's advertised. And then of course, those positions don't get exposed to. So that's number one, is that they don't, it doesn't reach to the average black person or more black people, let's say. So that's so interesting. Can I, can I say, just so I understand, because you're giving one example, but I never thought of it in this terms. And, and, and mm -hmm. it's maybe, maybe, so let's say you, and you're referring to the hidden job market where right. there's a job opening, but they're not giving it out maybe to recruiters or they're giving out selectively or they right. just want referrals. Right. So if you have a predominantly, let's say, you know, white uh, group of people working in that particular group, mm -hmm. the odds are not 100%, but the odds are high that if you're going to look for somebody as a referral, you're going to go to your network of the people you know. Right. And so you might find another white guy and bring it in. So what you're saying, right. that's like one of these things where, and to be fair, I had never thought of, you know what I mean? I really never thought of it in that way. But from what you're saying is that could be, that's a big problem because you're not even knowing that job is out there. You could have the right experience, the right background, but because you don't know those folks in that particular group, you're never going to find out about it. Never hear well, about it. Yeah, and not that, not that um, there's no crime against being all white. The problem yeah. is, uh, the problem is when you say, well, companies are stopped or are, are wondering why we're not as diverse. They want to do business with us. Yeah. And we've been trying to hire for years. Well, look where you go. And you bring up the actual thing about recruiting, you know, when it comes to colleges, you know, a lot of recruit the companies that have the money to spend to recruit the colleges are not going to where there's a lot of black people on the college 
like at my college, the University of South Florida at the time, there was only 3% black folks. But you have the recruiters who get there. And you know, a lot of times because of the way that, you know, even now, who gets the word first? Well, a lot of times it, it isn't the black students because they're not, they're, they are 97% in the deficit. There's only 3% of them. Some of them might have access, some of them don't. But again, everybody recruits so differently. But all what I'm saying is, is that as you begin to have a cycle of white people and you refer to, and that's a great point, is that well, most of the time white people recruit somebody who's like themselves. I'm not, we're not saying at all bringing up the R word, the racist word. We're just saying that you more than likely, you're going to think of your friends, your families, and maybe extension of those especially if you don't have many black friends, rather than saying, hey, if a company decides to recruit, let's, let's be intentional, let's make plans. Maybe we need to go to the, the historical black colleges and universities. So the HBCUs. So, you know, so a lot, of, a lot of what companies intend to do, they get in their own way because they're not willing to expend and extend um to reach out to those uh minority groups i think that I, I i don't i can't tie this together is that you hear all these companies particularly at the time you said when you started writing a lot about this with george floyd and, and, mm -hmm. and other horrible things that happened is that they're saying hey we want to hire more people of color mm -hmm. but then you don't see it so wh why do you think that does that doesn't happen because they're coming out publicly saying they want to do it Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then, but, but then you get somebody like the CEO from Wells, Ch Charles Sheriff, I think is his name, uh, who says that there's not hit, there's not black, there's not enough black talent, or the, or it's rare, or whatever he said at this particular point. Sometimes that statement just gets me. It's like all the resources that we have it available, just online. You mean to tell me there aren't qualified uh, candidates? And even even my white colleagues were like, uh, uh, mine's and yours are like, oh gosh, how tone deaf can you possibly be? And they'll spend the money to recruit, but they and they recruit, but they end up all these these white people again. And so you know, it's like, how can you say that? Uh, did you? It's not going to be a comfortable journey to get there, because you. But once you get there, you're going to realize, wow they're not much different than me. I, I mean, I don't get it either. And I'm not able to tie together those statements. But all in all, uh, a lot of times they're not, they're not doing what they can do. Have you spent the time at the historical black colleges? Do you go to their conferences? There's plenty of uh, conferences that minorities have where there's just minorities. And you don't want to spend the dollars, you spend the dollars going everywhere else. So therefore, it means that diversity really isn't that big of a deal, especially now that we know that companies, that was one of the first things that they cut in their budget when, when, uh, when COVID-19 started to hit, is that no more diversity training, no more diversity recruiting. Diversity, we're going to, that's secondary. We're just mm -hmm. trying to survive. Okay, that's... I mean, that's, you know, it's double speak in some sense. You say that's a priority, then when something hits, it's not a priority. Um, that's problematic. And that's why, you know, people look and don't believe you. Do you think companies should have policies and put themselves where, okay, instead of being just apolitical or neutral, mm -hmm. we're going to take a stand and we're going to try to champion social, certain social causes, racial equality. And do you think, and this is out there where some companies like Coinbase is saying, hey, we're apolitical. We don't want politics. If you can talk politics, we'll give you a severance parent, a package, no hard feelings, leave. Others will say, no, we're, we're all in. Do you think that would change if some companies would really say, hey, we're not just gonna talk about it. We're mm -hmm. gonna walk the talk and do stuff. That's a great question. And 
That was Christine's okay. question, by the let, way. Let me let me wait. wait that was Christine. Just you know, those are these are her questions. So I got to get. <laughs> no, no, and, and and you know, I appreciate you being honest. Yeah. Let me give you an example. So she gets credit for the great questions. That's <laughs> right, Christine. Right on. And by the way, I know I know Jack staff almost as much as my yeah. these days. You know, yeah. every every other day I'm getting a note from them. And, and it, it's really great. I really feel like I'm I'm a you're part of the family. Of right. Yeah. Yeah. You're part of the family, man. Yeah. Right. Right. But uh, it, let me give you this story and maybe yeah. you can glean from it okay. in this way. Uh, when I was much younger, I remember uh, there was a time. Wait, you're really young now. How much younger? Yeah, well, you know, I go back a few years. <laughs> but uh, but uh, my dad and I were in the store. And this little boy with a snow cone was running all over the place. And he happened to run into me. He must have been three. I must have been about 10. He ran right into me. He fell and, and dropped the snow cone. He started to cry. My dad, being who my dad is, said he went to the parents and said, hey, he ran to my son. Can I buy him another one? He said, sure, buy him another one. And he did buy him another one. At the same time, I was looking on like, well, I really like to have a snow cone. <laughs> where's my snow cone? <laughs> it's just like, where's, where's mine? I yeah. didn't get a snow cone. Yet. <laughs> but having to use that example, yeah. and probably some people are a little keen to what I'm trying to say, is that companies that say, let me give this money to this cause. And we're going, wait a second, if I'm an employee, wait a second. How about fairly pay me? Because you pay Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. We don't have the same salary. How about taking care of us first? Just like I wanted my dad to take care of me as much as him, maybe not even first. But now that you have this realization, take care of me too. So I would rather have a company said, and I think I've had a tweet somewhere out there that said, you know, you know, it, we realize that there's all these things going on in the world, and we realize that we uh, have a part to play. So therefore, we're going to start paying women and minorities their fair share, and we need to do back pay. Now, Pinston, Pinston did a good job in paying those professors back, if you remember back in the news a few weeks ago, where they, they, re, they did this study from 2014 on somebody can also correct me if I'm if I don't have the dates right and they gave back pay to those professors minority professors who weren't paid equally I wasn't aware of that I, yeah yeah I believe it was Princeton yeah so the point being is that I'd rather you take care of home first and then announce that you took her home and it and how great you feel or that maybe it, you know, and the companies that gave, like Chase gave millions of dollars out. But my question was, well, did you take the people, take care of the people that work for you? And yeah, that, I always wonder that too. We uh, make this initiative and it gets yeah, great public initiative. relations, but right. then it's like, okay, what did you really do? <laughs> like, what, what, what specifically did you do for, you know? Right. Or the best public relations actually would have been if you would have, paid the employees fairly and not say anything and let them tell the world. Right, 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 right. And then you know what kind you know what that that's much better public relations than having paid the million dollars to make all these announcements to fifteen hundred outlets. You know, yeah. so to me, all that, you know, I'd rather take care of home first. You know, I'm impressed by I was actually impressed in a small way, but it was fairly significant. The one of the founders of Reddit uh, that's married to Serena Williams, he says, I'll step down from mine. And I recommended to the board that uh, uh, that a black uh, yeah. person replaces me. And you see, that means a whole lot more than giving. I mean, I'm sure these organizations will hopefully will put it to good use. There's some of them that are, are out there that are just uh, are not actively uh, um, aggressive about uh, those initiatives. But a lot of times, what can I'm looking at the systemic racism that's right in front of us. It's you paying people fairly and you giving the opportunity fairly. We're not asking for a free pass. Minorities are not asking for anything special. 
we're just asking for a fair shot. What do you say? When, when, when you say, and I really don't, when you say systemic racism, how we, for people like myself, who's not really sure when you hear that, you hear that, that phrase very often, but what does that really boil down to? What, is, what does that really mean? It, it, there's, there are some things that are all on autopilot uh -huh. in this country. One of them is, is that uh, for many years within the system that, you know, if you, when you think about somebody being a manager or being a, an executive, that what's built into the system is that automatic you think that there's a white people there's there's white people involved but what ultimately has happened throughout the years that there's a disparity between races and opportunity and a lot of these things are just systemic in the fact that they automatically systematically uh make disparage those groups from from similar opportunities and everybody else if I can just make it as plain as possible. So, you know, when we talk about systemic racism, we're talking about things that are like in the corporate, like this, we just had the first person of color become, uh, and a woman become vice president after 200 and something years of, of, uh, of freedom, so to speak. But that freedom didn't exist in the same way it existed for white people. And for black people, we've had centuries of it historically. Now, granted, again, people, we can, I can say, well, you know, they didn't mean it and people have good hearts, but if you're slow in taking it down, then you're part of the problem. So, you know, if you're, if you're Chase, if you're uh, all these companies and you're saying that, you know, that we can't find uh, black talent and it's like, have you been deaf? over the past few years what are you doing to take steps to, to do it it's not it's not going to be something you could just throw money at that's being comfortable it's sort of like the homeless it's easy for us to give uh some change in the pocket that we have left in our pockets or give a dollar and thinking that yeah we kind of gave at the office but ultimately if you're not if you never fed a homeless person or if you never served a homeless person or been kind to a homeless person then yeah that problem is going to continue because a lot of other people do that so in a similar way companies have have what had they've done over the years was is that they given some position say hey we do have a diversity but if everybody if of the black and uh, black people and people of color in the mail room and and you guys are in a c-suite with nobody that looks like me then that's systemic racism and it's it interesting. so, be, so it's interesting because like what you're saying is that from the, the person who has a certain name and you get the resume and you make a, a presumption about them mm -hmm. all the way to a ceo and if you have a vision of a CEO, that's just going to form you. You say that's going to formulate your decisions in terms of hiring because you think, okay, this is what that person should look like. Like not only CCOs, you, I, you know, like CEOs usually are like six foot three. Seriously, there's a certain type too. Yeah. So it's not even a color. It's like it fits a certain model. What you see, it's like, I think maybe also a lot of the movies perpetuates it too. You say, okay, this is what this person should look like. This is what this person should look like. Right. And, and all of a sudden right. people are like, oh, okay, I'm used to this. So that's what it's going to keep doing, I guess. Yes. And, you know, I think when, it, when we get down to it, uh, one is that there are uncomfortable steps that people are willing to take, like pronouncing somebody's name. If somebody has a, a complicated name, um, the first thing you think, well, you know, I, I can't even pronounce this. And how, and then you start to make other presumptions that how the, uh, how your kids are going to be able to spell the names you give them. And you put that to the side. And, and not really even looking at that person's qual qualified or not. Now you can make the assumption that somebody isn't qualified, but you just looked at the name. And I know for a fact that that has happened because I've seen it happen. And in fact, I'll even say that some of it even bleeds over to where black people are, are, are part of the systemic racism problem because they've heard somebody else say it. So they think that's good for me to say it too. Say, oh, this person, we can't even pronounce his name either. Or, or better yet, if you're a person that even has, um, you know, the only chance of management you get is if it's over, uh, pe over people who are just black and not a, where it's a diverse or even just all white. 
I mean, it, it runs in so many ways and there's many precept, this, this, you know, this, the presumptions are often made, not even thinking about what it really means. And for, so for a lot of us, we're saying, well, this is what this really means. And people think, look at their intent and automatically think they're, they're innocent when we're not saying, you know, that you're going to be, this is a trial here. We're saying, give a second and third thought to what you're ultimately doing is that you're just taking one part of me. You just, uh, another thing is addresses. People look at addresses. They know the, the, the city, city of Chicago, they know certain parts of Chicago are going to be mostly black or mostly Hispanic or mostly this. But if they get somebody with my name, but notice that the neighborhood I come from, then of course they say, well, it may take them a little bit long to get here. Mm -hmm. So we can't hire for, hire for this position. We're downtown. We like somebody who's close. Of course, somebody who's close is going to, you know, in downtown Chicago, likely they're going to be white. So, you know, it runs so much more deeper than an hour can allow. Yeah. <laughs> but ultimately, I think people should be aware that it happens in the job search. And for Black people for many years and people of color, um, but especially for Black people, you don't get the first shot. You don't get the first assumption that there's a possibility that this person's qualified because based on even a name, address, or even maybe where I worked before. If I was a manager for a South Side company with three or four people and they were all Black, uh, and you know the company is a Black publication, um, I won't have a shot getting an editor's job at a, at, at a white publication because your, your assumptions are, so, oh, you just did these, you had these three or four people under you. You stated on your resume and you want to show that kind of as a result, as a way that say, yeah, I managed people before, but you don't get the shot because that's what it is. Now, I understand the dynamic too. People look at, you know, for instance, is you can and every, everybody can jump on this is that you know people who work for Microsoft have a better chance to work at Google rather than somebody who used to work for Ask.com. You know that's the way it is. People see you are, are aligned with the companies that you've worked for and worked with. So you know in the same way, but unfortunately, people don't make that extra connection or make the connection that, you know, someone of color is more just as qualified. Let's bring them both in. Let's give them both a shot, give them the same consideration. You don't necessarily have to hire us all the time, but doggone, you know, how long does that go on? <laughs> how long does that go on in the company where there's 800 people and only 5% of them are black or Hispanic or Asian? We have a few questions. So we have from, sure. and you got to forgive me if I'm mispronouncing the name, Sweaty, Sweaty, Sweta uh, Regni, about the salary gap is real and people need to talk about salary. Why isn't it even confidential? Um, yes. Does that factor into it, do you think, too, in terms of salary? So if you get the job, do you feel you might not be paid the same as somebody else? Yes, because often those jobs are given, they consider experience and not the job. So therefore, if uh, if you and I apply to the same job, but you have more experience, you deserve more based on your experience alone. Alone, experience doesn't always equal to competency. It's just, uh, and, and that's where you know that's where we all kind of had to grow up over here in the last 25, 30 years. Is you know, if I have five years of experience, uh, and somebody else has ten, but yet I have all the relevant education. But this person has just had ten years of experience. How would you know unless you have a chance to a chance to compare? Or you better yet, are they going to do a different job because they have more experience than I would? No, but that's an assumption. I wonder why doesn't this happen? Is that and this is a, another question? I'm paraphrasing. Let's take the Wells Fargo mm -hmm. scenario where they say, "Hey, there's not a pool of pool of talent." Mm -hmm. Why would it? 
And they're the CEO executives, right? They're pretty, I imagine they're pretty smart people. Right. Why wouldn't they say, okay, if you don't have that talent, just say, no, nah, we don't have it. What are we going to do? Invest in just training people mm -hmm. who have, maybe they don't have, you know, 10 out of 10 criteria what they're looking for, but they have four. All right, why not get some program to get them up? You know, to have, it's like in baseball, you have a minor league team yeah. and you're getting ready for the majors and so on. Yeah. You have college football that goes to the pros mm -hmm. and so on. Right. Why wouldn't they say, okay, let's presume for the sake of argument, hey, they can't find it. All right. But that means, okay, we just give up. But instead of saying, well, hey, now let's put a pipeline in place that we, we can get talent. I don't see that anywhere. Do you see that or? Uh, I've heard of tricklings of that I, happening. Yeah, I imagine Trick it is, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, tricklings. Yeah, and yeah. you bring up a great point, and I think that's something uh, to be understood. There are some companies that have realized and they have announced and said, we, 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 we need to train some people, put people in position to win. Um, when I got my first management position, a lot of it was because I had someone that championed me. Yeah. In fact, I had people who championed me. And gave me some some opportunities, and I uh, and gave me a chance to prove myself, and trained me purposely. I mean, it was it was department wide. I was getting ready, but ultimately, when they said, "Well, you don't have HR experience," and so you know, when I went to my boss, who was also my mentor, she says, "You don't have HR experience." but we can get you interviewing experience. So everybody that started to come through the door, I got a chance to interview with them, it, it, sitting, by, sitting with me side by side and working towards. That's somebody that championed people who care. You know, so and so sometimes it doesn't, take a corporate, it doesn't take a corporate decision to do yeah. it. If you're somebody that says, I really want to be an ally, I really want to, well, do that, do those simple things. Um, you know, if somebody doesn't have the management experience, maybe have somebody that quasi reports to them. And then you kind of mentor them through the process and help them get that kind of experience. And sometimes you can apply that in many different ways. Um, you know, it, even if it on a on the sweet, sweet level, you know, there are people who are work for, for the company might be two levels above below. And maybe you need to grab them and say, hey, why don't you come and watch me do these things or let me see you do these things and test and then closely mentor. And it's not, it's personal decision and then there's corporate decisions. Unfortunately, the corporate position, the decisions take way much more red tape uh, than than uh, uh, personal decisions, and a lot of times in you know somebody uh, to bring people uh, bring people of color and black people to the same uh, sweet sweet. All it is is just a matter of somebody saying is somebody being able to what they call sponsor, uh, so to speak. Uh, and I guess that's what it, th that wasn't the term back then, but that's what fortunately mm -hmm. I had. Uh, but a lot of times it's just say, hey, let me bring you on. Let me see if I can put you into these rooms. And again, it's a decision. It's not a process. It's not um, a bunch of applications and a bunch of testing uh, that needs to happen. But people don't make that decision because of the thinking that they have to follow the, standard, the status quo, which is hire people like me, that look like me, that sound like me, that act like me, therefore they have what I have and I can easily bring them on. So do you think it would make, so it sounds like one way to do it is people on an individual basis mm -hmm. could become a mentor, a sponsor, yeah. take someone under their wings, give them some guidance, and it could be at different levels, right? So, you know, it could be really involved, somewhat involved, but at least trying. And right. then also, and this is one of the questions too, for the C-suite, you started talking about it, do you think it should be more of trying to make change there? Because you know, with a lot of organizations, it's from the top down, they set the example. And mm -hmm. Alex Ohanian, is that how you pronounce Ohanian? Yeah. So yes. as he gave up his seat and said, hey, I'm gonna give it to a black person. Now it doesn't have to necessarily be that way, but somehow to say, hey, if we make changes at the board of directors mm -hmm. and at the C-suite, well, that kind of is gonna now be going down the whole chain, because as you pointed out before, when people could look and say, well, you know, the CEO 
the president is this, you know, you know, you know, Hispanic, black, a woman, and this, whatever it may be, say, mm-hmm. huh, okay. And yeah. then the managers down when they're making decisions, we keep that in mind. Do you think that's it's it's something would help or well, I would say even that would help. I think as well is some things could have been decided once people start having this revelation, really diversity could be like that yeast working through a batch of dough. You work it, you work it, you work it, you work it until it's ready to be baked. And the same way, that's the way diversity can be. And you can, it's not just diversity and making the optics look good, it's including them. And you know, again, there's enough studies to for people to Google where you know the diversity company, the company that diverse, they win, and they're winning consistently. And these days, every business is a global business because of internet, right? So they're able to reach that person in India, they're able to reach that person in Africa or in China or Antarctica, wherever they come from, and because some of those, a lot of those countries are hoping to find somebody that's like me, that's relatable. It's okay to speak the same language, but people go by relation when it comes to sales, uh, not just by that you look like my profile. Um, Such an interesting thing. Um, I have, we had another question. Do you think with Biden that it would change sooner, not change, be the same? Um, I don't know if change will be the particular word. Um, I think that Biden will has definitely have access to, of course, having a woman of color as his coworker and having worked for a, a black man. He now has has the the real time data. Uh, he has access to those voices. And sometimes that's a big deal, even more so than putting a bunch of initiatives that you can't measure into place. Um, I think that's going to influence how he's going to look forward. Um, I think in his first initiatives, there weren't a lot of things that were specifically uh, that were addressed to Black community needs at right now. But this is just the first weekend here. So there's plenty of time, and I think over time, he's everybody's president. We get that, but there, there, I don't know. It's hard to say that there'll be major changes. I think it will put the spotlight uh, on changes that will need to be made uh, through his administration, and I think he's going to be willing to do that more so than previous uh, administrations because he he's had these people uh, his his campaign manager is black, very diverse for, for a white president. He's probably he's had the, uh, arguably the most diverse uh, uh, campaign team uh, that we've ever seen. Uh, but uh, how that will play out? Well, it's hard to say because he also has a past uh, that he also needs to reconcile as well so that's about yeah, as i could see when you when i asked it you you, you, you it's like you see like okay yeah but there's a button there where yeah yeah there's there's a there's a button and understand he i mean if he was 50 years old and didn't have the history and voting track record that he has i would probably be less hesitant i had yeah. to think about it because understand that i you know i was voting in the early 80s 1980 was yeah. the first time i voted so i know and remember uh some key points they voted on that that didn't that was not in favor of the black community yeah so i guess i can tell after i asked a question i saw you like i go ah oh, I, I think i know what you're, <laughs> you're thinking of. so it's hard to say yeah, yeah I, I, I tried to be as polite as I possibly could. <laughs> that was very polite. <laughs> it was. So, you know, that's, with it, but that's where I'm at it. It's too early to tell. Yeah. Are, are there other points that we, we didn't bring up that, that I'm just looking to see any other interesting comments that you feel you'd like to share or bring out to, to the forefront that people may not be aware of? Mm-hmm. 
Well, I think the 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 pay disparity is is definitely has been an argument for a long time. I think PayScale has. Uh, uh, who is a content partner of mine, but uh, they have provided lots of data regarding the, the uh, racial gap, uh, pay gap that people can go look at. And you can just Google payscale.com. I put a colon and put pay gap and you'll see all these different studies and put racial pay gap in women. And they've, they've got a lot of data as well as other organizations, but I know PayScale because I've, uh, I've worked with them on, on lots of content throughout the years is, you know, they see this a clear disparity uh, in pay. Um, but a lot of times that comes through having the access and then the companies not just responding to mm -hmm. chance and and to be a part of the mantra, uh, if you will. Uh, unfortunately, Black Lives Matter gets mixed up with Black Lives Matters, the organization. And that's, you know, people, yeah. their homework, they can see that there's a there's a clear difference. Uh, so, you know, I think companies can do the work uh, that it takes, but I'd say take care of home first. I'd rather if Wells Fargo would have said, well, we paid everybody equally. I mean, I'm, we're talking about coin to position and, and, and your region markets and whatever gauges you use to do everybody else's. That's part of the point. But don't bring uh, a, a starting manager in at $75,000 who's white and pay everybody else who's not a white and a man uh, $65,000. That's where we, yeah. we got to kind of pay them all the same or don't pay them at all. This one thing that I, I, I don't understand with the pay gap, and I'm not saying it doesn't exist, it doesn't happen, uh -huh. but what did you think a company, and they don't even have to be an enlightened company, but mm -hmm. just a capitalist company say, wait a minute, if there's that pay gap, I'll arbitrage that pay gap, meaning mm -hmm. that if let's say you're making a certain amount less than the person next to you, mm -hmm. but you're as good, if not better, mm -hmm. if I was an employer, why wouldn't I hire you? Because theoretically you're paid less so I could give you a bigger raise and get you there. You know what I mean? So well, it goes back to me, I'm not sure if I understand. Like, you would think it would close in a capitalist society. It would close. Well, part of the capitalist society is is built on a systemic racism. You go back to that's like that's, that's what you run into. So it's like, and that's it's a like, perfect and that's a perfect together. aspect because you know a, a, a white man is going to have more experience coming in the door to have that position. Even if I outperformed him, he had the head start because of his experience and because of the access I didn't have. So therefore he's ahead. And the old mantra has been, yeah, we pay, we'll pay you, you know, and I get it. It's a, it's a competitive thing. It's competitive to the point, but competitive to whose cost? Usually it's been to a black person or a person of color where they had to, you know, they're outperforming, but, you know, ultimately that person came in with more experience. So, you know, the whole idea too, I mean, we can get really deep into performance reviews and that whole kind of thing. But yeah, if, if you had a head start, uh, that's, where, uh, that's where the problems end up being. And that's the perception. And I'll give you another example of a school that I spoke at, uh, a Southern school uh, several years ago, and people, clo uh, people close to me, and I think it's in one of my articles as well, knows the story fairly well, but they had this poster and they're talking about how diverse a campus they're going to be and this, that, and the other. And the poster showed three people uh, racing. Of course, the white man's winning with his briefcase the, the second one is a woman who, you know, she's hustling. And then you had the third black person who's tripping over himself. And this was a, this was a school that actually got uh, pretty disparaged in the news, particularly by the New York Times and Bill Maurer. But when I went to the campus, it's very interesting. They had this one whole campus where it was like an unspoken language, it was okay for them to be white. 
while everybody else had to be diverse. But they were okay to be white. So all of that to say is that eventually your, you know, your differences and how you feel about diversity comes out one way or another. And you know, and that's because the 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 idea with that poster is that yeah, it, you know, the white guy had a head start. I think also it's 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 also socioeconomic meaning. Let's say let's take I live in this town called Westfield in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. It's a nice middle upper middle class neighborhood not far from Manhattan. Mm -hmm. If you're living there and you go to school there and your next door neighbor is an attorney, the, the next door neighbor is a tax accountant, the, you know, and so on. Yeah. yeah, those kids are definitely gonna have an advantage over another town that like where I grew up, you mm -hmm. know, no one, I didn't know any lawyers or doctors or whatever. It just, it was, it was a lower socioeconomic place. It's so different than when my kids are growing up. Mm -hmm. But then if, I'm curious how you, what you think this. So, but then if you have, let's say, you know, one, one of uh, my neighbors is, is a dentist. He's a black man, black son. He's going to have all those benefits of being in that school system. Mm -hmm. And I'll have a heads up over either a white or, you know, you know, brown, black person in another neighborhood that just doesn't have those things. Right. So some of it could be, it's just in part two, it's just, if, if, if you're in the right area with the right connections, you're getting started to the school systems or sometimes, like I could tell you this too, like my, my parents were teachers and they mm -hmm. just passed away. Yeah. And they were teaching in East New York, Brownsville, Bed-Stuy. And at that time it wasn't hipster at all in New York. And you know, you're, you know, you're from New York. Yeah. And the school system never changed in 50 years. Mm -hmm. So the poor kids never have a chance to, when I say poor or whoever attended there really didn't have a fighting chance because it didn't care about it. Whereas, do you know what I'm saying? So it's sometimes is, it, is there other things that factor into that equation too? Well, well, once a black person crosses a certain socioeconomic status, doesn't mean that racism doesn't, doesn't end there. Once you've crossed that line as a dentist or for the doctors, there are plenty, there are doctors, if you, if you dig a little deeper in the American Medical uh, Association Journal, as pointed out, it's called JAMA for short, I think it's because I used to work for them. I know that they've shown that there is a great pay disparity compared to women and minorities compared to their white counterparts. So, you know, even though in one sense, I may get an advantage, like my kids went to private school. They went to private school all the way up. My oldest went to private school all the way to college, but at the same time, uh, he doesn't. He didn't get some of the uh, uh, scholarship uh, opportunities like his white counterparts that came from his same high school, and to some degree, he had even better grades. But they had access, and of course, again, that comes to that jump start to where you know the families grew up in that school and they have generations uh, attending that school. So of course they know all the corners and, and crevices of, the, of what scholarships are available. But those same scholarships aren't, aren't necessarily available to the black students who just, just happens to enter that system. And just yeah. have to, 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 you know, to be, they're in the same school, attend the same classes, they can even make the same grades, but one finds out that they knows because of history that certain scholarships are, are more available to them than they are, than they were to my son. So, yeah. you know, we can talk about being in the same place, but certainly we're not always there at the same time and forever yeah. how long, and unfortunately, the investment is made more to how long you've been there more than just being there. We have one more question. How about this? Because sure. believe it or not, it's been an hour already. That went yeah, really, know, right? really quickly. Right? <laughs> so uh, that I think you said with um, in some of your writings that a lot of the career advice is geared towards white collar professionals mm -hmm. and even white uh, professionals in general. Mm -hmm. And that it's not, you know, what it's not really geared towards you know, other folks. Mm -hmm. Do, could you, can you elaborate on that and talk about that? Sure. Uh, the approach is going to be the same as far as uh, 
because many times black people just don't have access to the information. I try to make it even more accessible and we can argue whether it's the same access or not. We, we can argue that. But at the same time, um, black people also now having this knowledge, they can also be a little bit more discerning of who they work for. So, you know, I'd rather work for uh, this company that has three board members who are black and, and that maybe that this 10% is 10% uh, minority than this company that's only 3% that have no blacks on their, on their board or their, or not. And you start to start to level down. Well, how many managers are there? And you can get that Intel if you, if you're doing your, uh, if you're doing your networking, your referencing, and you're trying to get referencing, you're doing all the homework that you need, you can find out what the makeup is. And many times it's on their website or somewhere somebody has posted it, Glassdoor, or there's annual reports and how they talk about getting more diversity. They keep failing every year while this company's not. I'm gonna work likely, even if I'm paid a little less, they're gonna look at me uh, uh, with a lot more favorable or a lot more favor than the one that pays, you know, substantially more. That's really good. That's, that's, you know, it's one of these things where it's, it's, it's frustrating because you, the way you point out, it's, you don't, I, I, I don't see like, okay, how this could change mm -hmm. anytime soon, you know? Right. So it's, you bring up these serious issues and, you know, you bring up issues like just like sometimes we'll talk about what to do with a job seeker. You get you can almost give it like, okay, here's what you do. Mm -hmm. Does it mean you'll get the job? Maybe, maybe not, but at least you have a shot here. It sounds like right. we just just right. Well, just, ultimately, just, uh, yeah. not everybody's the the Washington football team who, you know, for years they used the word redskin as part of their name. And people have said, and people have said, you need to change your name. The owner said, nope, until somebody with money came along <laughs> and said, you need to change your name. Oh, now there's no argument. Now we'll just be for this season, the Washington football. What was that? That was FedEx who, who had the naming rights. Just like, yeah, hey, it was somebody, it was some major that. player that, that yeah. and they said, you need to change your name. Well, I don't know what happened to them all those other years, but finally they took a stand and said, you yeah. need to change it. So of course the person with money, and that's part of the systemic racism yeah. part too, is that it takes money to make uh, make an overhaul change. And so the people with money, and and that's the, where the disconnect. You rather give it away than to change at home, yeah. <laughs> change the people. I mean, and let them tell and say, yeah, I got this raise, and this is how. Good. I think they looked at how how much they had to change as opposed to uh, thinking the end game is that the whole world will know. Because people who are grateful, they're gonna tell. And it will start one person and they'll think now this company is great because you, I mean, the, at yeah. least you start to get on the right road because you, you're paying me fairly. I didn't realize I was, I was that far behind. So there you have it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, all right, I lied. Can I get one more question? We can go as long as you want. Yeah, <laughs> one more, and this is this is more for me. Um, what uh, now? I forgot the question I asked after you were doing this. Um, well, it's not. It's 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 not. I don't know if it's a question or just a throw out there. And you you kind of mentioned this at the beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you may have not noticed this, but I'm a white guy. Yeah. Yeah, I know we don't notice these things, yeah, so you yeah, know. No things that I had kicked off. With. <laughs> you know, so I figured let you know. That. Uh, and sometimes I think, and I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's awkward to engage in conversations because you don't know what you, you don't want to say anything inappropriate. You don't want to say anything that could be deemed offensive. And I'll, I'll I'll kind of go on a limb and say I think that happens to a lot of people, and I think that hurts having an open conversation because. You know, you're, you, you're walking on thin ice because you just don't want to say the wrong thing, especially in the culture we have now where mm -hmm. it's easy to just attack somebody. Yeah. Do you think if, if we had a more open, real dialogue, that could help out? Um, yes. Not only will it help out, but you, you can decide for yourself what's going to, if you need to pay a part, first of all, if you need to play a part, secondly, 
is how you'll play a part. And I would say, you know, recently there was a there was a hospital in the United States, I forgot where, where they had discovered there were a lot of bodies in their morgue because of COVID. And yet uh, people, there were certain people who didn't know that all, you know, all, all these pets, unless you were higher up in the administration. But anyway, there was this one security guard who knew, who was asked by an authority, you know, said, well, how many people have died? And they heard one number from the administration, but the guard said, I know where the dead bodies are. And he was able to go and show. And that's where the part can be played for people to play. If you really want to be an ally, expose where the dead bodies are, expose where the pay raise gap is, expose where the where systemic racism is. If you know you're getting advantages that somebody you work with as a coworker isn't and it should be fair, then expose it, tell it. But of course, too, you're also asking that person to go with, through hundreds of years and centuries of where his or her family has not recognized the disparity between black and white people or, or white people and, and people of color. So they've got to fight that and possibly be demonized, possibly be demonized because of that. So that's asking that person to say and do quite a bit. And it's going to take some time because people will think, well, what about my friends? What about the jokes that I've heard? Uh, or the, the, the acts where it was kind of fun, but it's not as funny anymore. We did to this black guy or the, to this uh, Chinese person, to, to this, uh, this, his, this Latino. You know, you got to think of all those things. Some people will come around at different times than others, but yeah, it is going to be chipping away, unfortunately. There's no great reveal where everybody will have a watershed moment. No. I really appreciate it. And I think I think this is healthy to do. I know it's probably not I think it's awesome. co really comfortable for you to have to go through this and, and talk, you know, talking to everybody. I know you're passionate about it. Mm. And and this is something that's, you know, obviously important to all of us. And uh, and hopefully, you know. As more people have these conversations on platforms like this, it, it opens their eyes, you know, to what's going on. Because you brought up a lot of things, like I never, you know, to be very honest, never really thought about, never looked at it in that lens. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people like that by just having these dialogues and listening. Well, I appreciate you, you sharing so. your platform with me, even though we kind of shared the, a lot of the same <laughs> platform. But uh, but uh, all in all, no, I, I think it's excellent. I appreciate it. you didn't have to do this. You're just starting a podcast. And then I'm what one of your first four or five guests. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 Nothing like jumping into the deep end with serious topics, right? And, and, and I don't know. I don't honestly, I don't know any white male uh, podcast that's going to do that. And you'll be one of the first that I know of. Uh, I never even thought of it that way to be. Yeah, so, it didn't occur to and me. you never thought about it, but I want yeah. to give give you credit because you went down that road. And uh, you know you I it. saw your writings. And I'm like, wait a minute, we got it. How can we not talk about this? You know, I mean, this is well, something well, I can tell you really and that's you know, part passionate reason, about. And let's that's see. part of the reason why the my method, yeah. my method to the madness is to open up an amicable discussion. Yeah. It's not to, you know, I'm not trying to uh, tackle the bear and put them in, in, a, in a stronghold. I'm just trying to say that there's a bear and we need to address the bear. Yeah, I think, I think you're a great advocate for it because you yes. just walk it out very yeah. straightforward, very plain facts. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's helpful for people to listen and absorb it like, huh, and give something to think about that either they thought about but didn't want to think about it or didn't really, you know, it's, it's, I didn't see it through. So this is, I think this is really good and really helpful and really informative. Thank you. I'm glad it, I'm glad it is. And oh. I hope it is then, and that I'll get more messages uh, that uh, from people who want to talk about it. At yeah. length. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thank this is great. And then I will see you. I'll see you Wednesday. 
Yes, we'll, we'll uh, yes. Uh, wait, so what day is today? Mo it's Monday, right? I, it's Monday. I'm really excited. Like, so we've got Wednesday, we've got two more days. <laughs> it's so funny, Mark. I saw on Twitter, yes, they say, oh, it's gonna be a long Monday, whatever. And I came in to work yesterday because I have no life and mm. you know we're kind of on lockdown. So I was working and I'm like, wait, Monday? It's like, oh my God, all right. Uh, so, so off on the days of how it is. So. Yeah, that's my little note to yeah. kind of say, hey, we got a show coming. Yeah, <laughs> all right, so Wednesday, okay. Yes. All right, my friend, it was great speaking to you and I'll see you then. Thank you all so right. much. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.